Some passages are more difficult to get our minds around than others when we look at Scripture. I know that's likely your experience too, at least it's mine. I'm happy because today I find that these four passages that we've just read are all rather accessible, and I think you'll be able to link them together with me as we think about the theme for today, God's goodness to us in spite of it all. Last week I talked a little bit about coming to terms with what happens to us in this life, coming to terms with misfortune, coming to terms with evil, coming to terms with loss, sickness, death, coming to terms with these things that make us look to the heavens and say, why, Lord, why? I suggested that we look at Rick Rice's book on the subject, published in 2014. Rick Rice has suggested, as he studies theodicies, that is to say the classic question theologically of why, if God is all-powerful and all-good, there's evil in the world. He gives us seven different portals through his book with which to look at the problem. I reviewed those last week. That sermon is available online, so if you missed it, you may want to go back and look at it. But in those seven portals, he offers different windows of hope. And I took those and correlated at least three or four of them last week to biblical passages. Because while some people hold the opinion that there's a unified view in Scripture, I don't think that's really accurate. I think different stories and different books, different perspectives give us just that. Different points of view on how God is acting, working, and moving in the world. And so we had from Scripture several different examples last week of how God works in the midst of evil, in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of sickness, sadness, loss, death, and so forth. So last week's title was Coming to Terms. How is it that we, in this journey with God, in our faith, in our walk, come to accept the harder things that are part of our reality? How is it that we reconcile our faith in God and our pleas to him in prayer, our sense of his goodness, our sense of his grace and his strength and majesty and power with all the things that seem to happen in spite of our pleas, in spite of our prayers, in spite of our hopes, and in spite of the fact that we think we can see a clearer and a better way. Any of you ever think you could be a better God than God? Oh, admit it. You have. Oh, admit it. I know that there are moments that I say to myself, now, if I were God of the universe, this is the way this would play. I always have to take a small measure of comfort in the fact that I'm not God of the universe. However much I may think I know better or want it in that moment, However much I feel like my vision is clear and my direction obvious, I know that I know nothing in the big picture of things and that he knows all that there is to know. He knows all that can be known, including the blind spots in my eyes and the dark spots in my heart. So today we're going to flip this around a little bit. I'm not asking you if you're in the midst of a grieving process to skip ahead to the end. No. This won't move any of us through the processes that we're going through more quickly or even differently. But I do want to hold out this, this thought because it's all the time, it's ever present a reality to us if we'll access it. And that is that In the midst of pain, there's still life. In the midst of suffering, there's still goodness. In the midst of loss, there's still hope. And these are the things that God brings us 
primarily as Christians as we understand them in Christ. We access them by counting the goodness of God in developing a sense of gratitude. So when we're sick, we can still say, yet if he slay me, still will I trust him. We can say, I know that neither life nor death nor principality nor power can separate me from the love that is God. We can say, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that one day he'll cause me to stand too. We don't get a get-out-of-jail-free card as Christians. We don't get a pass-the-suffering point as Christians. We don't get any kind of escape. The life we live in the here and now is a human existence, a finite one, and it doesn't always go well. And that's not to say that isn't tragic. And that's not to say that isn't horribly upsetting and painful. We live in a world that's, that's tearing itself apart right now. That's even more brutal. War everywhere, people killing each other. Terrible atrocities committed in the name of God and religion. And how do we as Christians bear witness? How do we as people who want to live our lives with God stand in light of the evil that is? It may seem trite at first glance, but it is remembering in the midst of all that we go through God's goodness to us that there is something is a miracle in and of itself, and then that something is part of God's creation and redemption and plan is even greater. Let's just take a look at our texts and see if we can sort of build a case for ourselves as we journey this year with God, as we live our lives with God, before God, and think about what it is that God wants for us and from us in the light of the fact that there is misery, pain, suffering, loss, death, agony. The first tool we have at our disposal, and I've talked about this many times before, is found right at the beginning of our Psalm 13. It's a lament, and it's a cry, and it's an anthropomorphism. What does that mean? It means that David is projecting a human quality onto God. And that human quality that he is projecting onto the Lord is forgetfulness. How long, Lord? How long? How long will you forget me? Will it be forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? and day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Do you hear the lament? Lord, I'm talking to you. I've raised my voice to you. I've spoken to you. I don't see anything happening. I'm constantly harassed. There's sorrow, pain in my heart. My life is on hold. Nothing seems to be answered. Nothing seems to be changing. Are you sleeping? Have you forgotten me? Very human. Lament. It's a tool in the arsenal of grace. Verse 3. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. What do you think this psalmist is saying when he uses that phrase, look on me? He wants to be seen, doesn't he? Have you ever felt invisible? You were the kid in the class that raised your hand and the teacher never picked you? No, not you, Johnny. I was pointing to Johnny. Have you ever stood in a line for P.E. and you were the last one picked and you weren't picked because it was a default? 
you're automatically on this other team. Well, I don't. I can't think of much that that uh, is more disappointing than that. Have you ever worked your tail off for a boss and felt like no matter what you did, the other guy always got the promotion or the raise or both? Have you ever been in a family? where your parents absolutely, totally adored your older brother and you got the hand-me-downs. Have you ever felt invisible in a crowd? I remember walking through the streets of Korea not realizing the culture with my three-foot personal boundary barrier as a Westerner And having people bumped into me, bumping into me, and I thought, what am I, invisible? Do you not see me walking down the sidewalk? Took some getting used to culturally. We've all felt invisible. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. In other words, David is saying to God, look at me. I'm talking to you. I'm pleading with you. And he's exhorting God, listen, if you don't answer, this is what it's going to look like to people. Moses did this all the time. Moses did this all the time. Lord, just think about how you're going to look to the people of the surrounding countries if you wipe out your people Israel. Think about it. You don't necessarily want to do this. I'm telling you, you may be angry right now. You may want to wipe them all out and make of me a great nation, and that's really flattering, but just think of what this is going to look like to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Cushites and the, you know. Just think about it, Lord. Remember when Moses said that? You think I'm making this stuff up, don't you? Well, you need to go back and look. Moses does this. Moses was really good at it. So the second arsenal we have is to cry out and say, I may be just a creature, but see me. And know that what happens affects the way people see you. But then David comes back. We may think of it as a projection. He may be, he may be projecting a faith he hopes to achieve. He may be pushing toward a goal verbally that he hopes will convince himself. Or he may be making a statement of implicit faith. But after I've said I feel forgotten, after I've said how long, O Lord, after I've chided and pleaded and cajoled, after I've asked for you to see me, here's what I'm going to say of you, Lord. My trust is in you. I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing your praise, for you have been good to me. Pardon the paraphrase. Where is this obvious that God has been good? David feels forgotten. He believes his enemies are going to triumph over him. He wonders that if God doesn't come to him soon and enliven him, he's going to find himself dim of eye. That is to say, the light has gone out of the eye. That is to say, the life has gone out of the body. He's pushing toward the grave here, or so he sees himself as. He is discouraged. He's feeling isolated. He's frustrated. And out of all of that, in you will I trust because you have been good to me. In our lives with God, as we suffer, as we experience loss or setback or frustration or pain, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death in sickness or we experience loss of a loved one, we need to be able to say, my trust is in you, for you have been good to me. That is not easy. 
But as I suggested, maybe the psalmist is projecting this out so that it can become the reality. You know, they say that if you'll smile, it will actually change the way you feel. If you practice putting on a smile for a period of time, if it's a photo smile, your face is going to start twitching and it's going to freeze eventually. You know, that kind of <laughs> kind of thing. You know, it's not going to work for you. But if you are smiling to yourself about something or carrying that song in your heart, so to speak, your brain chemistry will change and your attitude will follow. It may be that David is just practicing a spiritual discipline of saying, no matter what I'm going through, trust will be my mantra and the goodness of God will be what I celebrate and declare. Moses has another experience. I don't know that I've ever paid so much attention to this passage as I did this week. It's very, very, very intimate. Moses is talking with the Lord. You've been telling me, Lord, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. That's powerful right there. Moses is saying, God, I know you see me. I know you know who I am. I know you've called me. What I'm not clear about is who you're sending. So here's what I would like. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And remember that this nation is your people. Don't you love that reminder? Remember, this is the, these are the folks you've called. <laughs> and the Lord replies, he doesn't say, I know, I know they're my people. He says, my presence will go with you. You want to know who's going to go with you, Moses? My presence will be with you. You want to know who's going to be your, by your side? I will be by your side. I will be with you. And I will give you rest. Didn't Jesus say something like that? Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest unto your souls. Again, a paraphrase. Rest. Presence of God and Moses will be at rest. And so Moses said to God, if your presence, and it's interesting in the translation I'm reading that, P is capitalized. If your person, your presence, does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Don't send us to where you won't be. How will anybody know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? I tell you what will. It's God's presence. It's a sense that we carry that God is with us even to the end of the earth or the age Matthew lo I'm with you always even to the end of the age Jesus says we carry with us a sense of his presence and that in turn distinguishes us it indicates to us not only that we've been seen but that God is pleased and his presence is a marker of witness for everyone else and the Lord said to Moses, verse 17, I'll do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. A name is a powerful thing. That's why we're wearing name tags today. It's a powerful thing because at my age and with the number of people I meet, you can tell me your name and see me the next week and I'm likely to draw a blank spot. Not because I don't care. It's not because I'm completely without mental faculty. It's just difficult sometimes, as important as names are, for us to retain them. And we all have a need to be known to some degree. So Moses goes to a next level in the conversation very quickly. There's no indication of a waste of time. I'm pleased and I know you by name. And Moses says, great. 
Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, hmm. It's not in the translation, hmm. But I think it was there. Hmm. Tell you what, Moses. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. God can't reveal his glory to Moses, or he chooses not to. He's not going to give Moses his face. His radiance. But he's going to cause all of his goodness to be seen. I think sometimes in our walk with God, we want revelations of glory. Show me, God, what you're capable of. Show me your power. Show me your glory. It's the same question we ask often in our prayers, particularly when we're thinking of a miracle that we want. But what God says to someone whose name he knows and whose face he's seen and whom he's talking to and whom he's pleased with, I cannot give you or show you my glory. But my goodness I will reveal. God has been good to us. God has been good to me. And so the Lord said, there's a place near me may, where you, stand, you may stand on the rock. And when my glory passes by, here it is, glory, goodness may be interchangeable. I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. I don't know what kind of a body God has. I don't know how God is embodied, if in any kind of way that we understand and relate to, but at least as he tells Moses what's going to happen, he says, look, this is going to be way too much for you. I'm going to tuck you away in a place where very little of me will be seen, where you will be protected. I'm going to show you my back. I'm going to give you my goodness, not my glory. I'm going to give you my back, not my face, because you will be utterly destroyed by that. And I'm pleased with you. I love you. I want you to be my leader, my servant, and to take my people to the promised land. God honors Moses in the most amazing way imaginable. But the story tells us that he does it with goodness, not just glory. That's a tool in our armor as well. God knows you by name. May not always be happy with us. We don't always deserve to be happy with, right? But he knows us by name, and he's forgiven us, and his grace is always there, always ours, and he wants to be intimate with us. And if we're going to achieve that, if we're going to know him, we're going to be looking not for his glory, but for his goodness. Our New Testament reading in Thessalonians is wonderful. The writer of Thessalonians, Paul, is saying, we pray constantly for you that God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this name thing comes up here. The name of our Lord Jesus might be glorified in you. That was in our Exodus reading as well. God doesn't just pass by, he speaks his name. Now, this is a phenomenal thing because, again, as I was saying earlier, the self-revelation that comes in name and the meanings that names contain is quite profound, especially in the Middle East. And as most of you know, the Hebrews to this day, when they write the name of God, put no pronunciation or guide marks for pronouncing the name, all consonants, so that in point of fact the name cannot be pronounced. 
And it is considered a violation of the commandment of God not to take the name of the Lord in vain, to even say the name of the Lord. And so there is no verbal iteration of his name. That's the regard with which the Jewish nation and the Jewish faith and religion has come to regard God's name. But God speaks it to Moses. This revelation of person is powerful. And in Jesus Christ, we have his name as a revelation. Jesus, the Lord saves. Christos, the Messiah. May he be glorified in us and us in him according to the grace of our Lord, our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at John 15, 8 to 11, where Jesus talks about He's praying and he's talking about oneness. You see this echoed. Paul is echoing John 15, 8 to 11, I believe here, when he talks about the connectedness of us to God and God to Christ. We could take a moment, I suppose. Time is running down, but we could take a moment to look at that passage. John 15, 8 to 11. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I think that's echoed here. As the fathers loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now let's read the Thessalonians passage again. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling, that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that, in the, name, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have that word glory in there, glorified, and we have that word grace. And I think it could be argued that when we think accordingly of the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not just referring to unmerited favor. We're looking at God's goodness. And surely God has been good to us. Titus 3, our last passage. Titus outlines in the first verse the way in which we live. Lives of foolishness, disobedience, deception, enslaved by passions and pleasures. We live lives of malice and envy and hatred, being hated and hating. But now he says that's no longer the case. The kindness and love of our God and Savior appeared to us saving us, not because of righteousness we've done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. That passage is not mitigated because you're going through bankruptcy. That passage is not mitigated because you got a flat tire or totaled your car. That passage is not mitigated because you've got an illness or a disease. That passage is not invalidated by your hopes or ambitions or angers or fears or prayers that you don't think were answered the way you wanted them answered, or things that didn't happen that would have happened if you were God of the universe. That is not invalidated by death or birth. What instead it is doing, it is carrying for us all of our hope and all of God's goodness in the person of Jesus Christ through whom and by whom we have the hope of glory, not now, but through him and in the life to come. 
this is God's goodness to us. That in the midst of all of our pain and all of our difficulties, suffering, evil, sickness, death, sorrow, in the midst of everything we would say that's bad, God's redemptive grace is yours. And his salvation is yours in the person of Jesus Christ. And his eternity is opened to you in the person of Jesus Christ. And hope is yours because our God has been so good to us. And if we'll learn to say that and mean it, if we'll learn to reflect with gratitude on the goodness of our God, a joy will emerge that can't be quenched even in the midst of pain and sorrow, suffering and loss. May God through Christ join us ever more closely to himself for he has been good to us.